Philippians was the most Christological of the epistles. The most eschatological is Thessalonians or Thessalonians. No other books of the Bible speak as clearly and unambiguously about the return of Christ as does Thessalonians. Revelation is cloaked in apocalyptic symbolism. Zechariah is cloaked in apocalyptic symbolism. Daniel is cloaked in apocalyptic symbolism. Matthew 24 appears straightforward, <clears throat> but trying to reconcile things which are straightforward in Matthew 24 or the Olivet Discourse with things that are more, more complex, like Daniel, is not easy. Matthew says, Jesus says this in Matthew and Luke 21, and Daniel says this, putting the two together is not easy. The linchpin of the epistles, especially 1st and 2nd Thessalonians. There's nothing that speaks as clearly about the return of Christ as these two epistles. It's like this. You do arithmetic before you do algebra, you do algebra before you do calculus. We interpret the complicated things in light of the things which are straightforward. It's like building blocks. Always look <clears throat> at the book of Revelation through the prism of the Olivet Discourse. Matthew 24 and 25, Luke 21, Mark 13. Look at Revelation and its Old Testament counterparts through the prism of the Olivet Discourse. Look at the Olivet Discourse through the prism of the epistles, especially Thessalonians. Think of the epistles as inspired commentary. It's the Word of God, but it's the Holy Spirit's commentary on other scripture. When the epistles have typology, it either explains the typology or assumes the reader understands it from their culture. Jude, for instance, is not only midrash in terms of its hermeneutics, in terms of its interpretation of scripture, it's midrash as a literary genre, but it assumes the readers can understand what it means. When the epistles use some kind of symbolic language, it's clear what the symbolic language means. There's no narrative with, with typology in it. It's just all straightforward. It explains the rest of scripture. The epistles are the Holy Spirit's commentary. Do I read commentaries? I read the epistles. <laughs> The epistles are, are God's commentary on the rest of the Bible. If you want to know what the rest of the Bible means, we read the epistles. Hebrews explains Leviticus. Well, First and Second Thessalonians explains the Olivet Discourse. Our focus will be on the eschatology. But let's begin. Paul leaves Thessalonia, Thessalonica facing persecution. It would appear he was hoping that his departure would cause the persecution to ease on the local church, but that, of course, does not work. Then they find themselves being persecuted. This church always remains something of a jewel in his crown. When he leaves it in around 50 AD, in the early summer, it appears to be a jewel in his crown. It is the second significant church he plants, uh, the third, sig third significant church he plants, sorry, the th second significant churchy plants, uh, but it grows and it has a number of prominent members in it. Paul and Silvanus and Timothy to the church of Thessal Thessal Thessalonians and God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace and peace to you. Again, his introductory salutation. He puts the salutation first instead of at the end and he puts it in the form of a blessing. Okay, now what's happening here is, is really quite interesting. The church in Thessalonica has a difficult beginning because of the opposition. Has a difficult beginning. Whenever you plant the church, it will be attacked in the beginning. But difficult beginnings do not indicate things are going to fall to pieces in the future. This church continued to grow and blossom despite difficult beginnings. Again, they were making headway. Whenever God does something new, Satan will attack it. Any new church being planted will be attacked. That is the molding process. It's getting the foundation right. God will spend a long time getting a foundation right. Once the foundation is right, then you can build. But don't build on a wrong foundation. In the midst of opposition and persecution, they were still trying to build the foundation. Imagine trying to build something <clears throat> when you're being attacked all the time. Well, that's like the nation Israel. 
It has a foundation, not only in biblical prophecy, but when they were trying to irrigate the deserts and drain the swamps and begin kibbutzes and moshavs, they were being attacked by Muslims. So they were trying to build something at the same time they were being attacked. Well, that's sort of like what happened in Thessalon Thessalonica. They were forged in fire. But when something is forged in fire, born out of tribulation, it has quite a foundation. It has quite a solid foundation. And so he begins to write. He's writing from Corinth. And he gives his explanations about what he's been doing. And he begins speaking of the Holy Spirit right from the beginning. Our gospel did not come in verse 5 to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction, just as you know what kind of men we proved to be among you for your sake. You also became imitators of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much tribulation with the joy of the Holy Spirit. The church themselves faced the kind of persecution Paul did. He would rather later go on explaining the same as the unbelieving Jews persecuted Jewish believers, now the unbelieving Greeks persecuted the Greek believers. Okay? We talked about that yesterday. But when he gives a salutation, it's Paul and Silvanus and Timothy. Even Paul never tried to be a one-man show. He always said who was with him, on whose behalf he was writing, what he was saying, what he was doing. Be careful of people who will always preach, I did this, I did that, and I did this, and then I did, as if God's world revolves around them. This was never Paul's attitude. But I think that all of us have enc encountered people in their newsletters and in their, their oral presentations that they do seem to think that everything God is achieving, he's achieving through them. <laughs> Paul was not like that. Paul was never like that. For the word of the Lord has sounded forth for you, not only in Macedonia and Asia, but also in every place your faith towards God has gone forth, so that we have no need to say anything. This is really important. Once a church is really established, how do you know when a church is established? You know a church is established the same way you know a Christian, a convert, has been discipled. When is a convert discipled? A convert is discipled when they can disciple another. When is a church really established? When it can send out missionaries and plant another one. <laughs> one of your children grown up, when they're old enough not only to biologically reproduce, but to bring children up themselves. <laughs> your children are grown up by the time that they are spiritually, emotionally, as well as physically capable of having their own children. That's when you know your kids are really grown up. That's when you know your job is done, now you gotta go do another job. They, they've got to pick up. Well, it's the same. The same as applies to an individual applies to a church. We call this Kalva Homer. Kalva Homer, light to heavy. Okay, it's one application of Kalva Homer. Okay. A church is established when it can plant other churches. A Christian is discipled when they can disciple others. Okay. Let's continue. For they themselves report about us what kind of reception in verse 9 we had with you and how you turned to God from idols to serve a living and true God. Now remember he's writing from Corinth. In Corinth he refers to the Greek gods as demonoi, demons. Basically he's quoting Moses as, a, as it's the Septuagint translated Moses from the Hebrew word Shadim. Other gods are demons. To us we think of Greek gods as mythology. It's purely mythology. Think of it the way you think of an Hare Krishna. The, the, the Hare Krishna is a demon god in, in Hinduism. He's a demon. Hare Krishna is not a god. Hare Krishna is a demon. There's no god. It's just a demon on the back of that statue and the back of that. Well, that's what Paul was up against. Other gods are demons. Whenever the object of veneration. This is also true in necro necromancy. When people pray to the dead, you saw those people kissing the images yesterday. This is necromancy. If they have any communication with the dead, it is what we call in Hebrew, ovot, familiar spirits. There's a demonic element in all these things. You have the great divide <laughs> between the finite and the infinite, between the temporal and the eternal. The only way to cross that divide is the one who crossed it, Jesus. He came down and he went up. In his place operates the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the only one who is the 
avenue to communicate with the supernatural, with, with, with God, okay? Now what you had in the pagan world is what you see today, people trying to use icons, idols, statues, images as vehicles of communication with the great beyond. This was antithetical to what Paul was saying. Paul kept saying, it's the Holy Spirit, it's the Holy Spirit, it's the Holy Spirit. How do we communicate with the Lord through the Holy Spirit? You see what they were doing yesterday in Berea. They were using, they were essentially putting images in, to, to do with the work of the Holy Spirit, weren't they? In that instance. Now the Holy Spirit does other things as well, which also become counterfeited. But we'll talk about that when we get further along. Not today, tomorrow. And in Patmos. Then he continues. You yourselves, brethren, with know that our coming to you was not in vain, but we already suffered and been mistreated in Philippi. As you know, <coughs> we had the boldness of, in, our, in our God to speak to you the gospel of God amidst much opposition. <coughs> be careful of those who will tell you how to be spiritual when they've not proved it by their own example. The reason Paul could encourage a persecuted church was because he suffered persecution himself. Be careful of people who will tell you how to be spiritual when they haven't been there and experienced what you've experienced. <laughs> it's easy for some rich money preacher from America or South Africa to go on TV and say, you don't have to suffer, you're a king's kid. And then he gets in his limousine and drives on and shakes down the next pack of naive, undiscerning people. Be careful of people who will tell you how to be spiritual. Pay attention to people who will show you how to be spiritual with their lives, their experience, their example. Okay, that's what he's saying here. For our exhortation, in verse 3, does not come from error or impurity or by way of deceit. Error, impurity, deceit. You will always find that sequence. Error, wrong doctrine. They'll be teaching some erroneous doctrine. Doctrine always comes first. When they had to put on the armor in Ephesians 6, what did they put on first? Right, breastplate of righteousness? No, the belt of truth. Truth always comes first. Doctrine always comes first. If you don't know what right doctrine is, you won't know what right conduct is. First, there is false doctrine. Most error comes from false doctrine. If somebody goes off morally, you'll find what they begin doing. Changing their doctrine to try to accommodate their immorality. So often when you see somebody who's solid begin to go off doctrinally, that is a symptom that they're going off morally. Okay. First comes the error. Second, impurity. Again, this idea of catharsis, a catharsis. A mixture. It's not to say everything they say is false or all their motives are wrong. But there is a mixture of self-serving interests and God-serving interests. There's a mixture of wanting to serve the Lord and serve themselves. There's a mixture of putting others first and themselves second, or putting themselves first and others second. It's not to say they do no good or say no good, it's just to say that their motives become ambiguous. Because their doctrine becomes mixed, their motives are mixed. And then thirdly is deception. Once this happens, there'll be deception. So you'll have error, impurity, deception. The way spiritual deception works is the same way, a mixture of truth and error, of right motive, of wrong motive, of people saying and doing right things with people saying and doing wrong things. Only it's orchestrated, it's planned, it's contrived. Look at Jehovah's Witnesses. When they knock on the door, half of what they say will agree with. The Mormons, half of what they say will agree with. The Roman Church or in this country, the Greek Orthodox Church, half of what they say will agree with. But there's error, there's this mixture called impurity, and the result will always be deception. Forget about there's some truth in something. God's truth is not impure. It's pure. It's pure. But let's look. When the people do this, look what it says in verse 5. We never came to you with flattering speech, as you know, nor with a pretext for greed. God is witness. When preachers pr play this game of the error, the impurity, and the deception, they are out for the buck in some way. They're chasing the dollar, the euro, the pound, the yen. They're chasing money. They're chasing some kind of temporal gain. That is how it works, and there were people doing it. Verse 6, nor did we seek glory from men. 
either from you or from others, even though as apostles of Christ, we might have asserted our authority. He says, look, I'm an apostle. He affirms who he is. He affirms the authority he has from Christ and in Christ. But he never overplayed that card. To him, it was just a function. In the body of Christ, leadership is relational and functional. It is not hierarchical. Leadership is relational and functional. It is not hierarchical, not even for an apostle. The only one above all is Jesus, because he's God. But look at how these guys work again. There's a pretext for greed. Following the money is self-glorification. They're into self-glorification. Now, in the last days, this stuff increases big time. Big time. They get cult followings. But he says, we prove to be gentle among you as a nursing mother tenderly cares for her own children. Again, he compares himself to, to, to a maternal figure the way Jesus did with Jerusalem in Matthew 23, like a mother hen trying to gather her brood of chicks. Having thus a fond affection for you, we are well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives, because you became very dear to us. It was not just his words, it was what he and they did. Okay? He goes on saying how he thanks God for them and, uh, and how God's performing his work through them. And again, he didn't deny he had power. He said not only came in words, it came in power. But the words came first. Faith always cometh by hearing, hearing the word of God. These signs follow. These signs follow. Yes, there were demonstrations of dunamis, of power, but the first power has to be in the Word of God. Somebody can preach the Word of God with no power and it will not convict anybody of sin. They can preach the Word of God and it will not change anybody's life. Only the Holy Spirit can put power into the Word. Okay? Only the Holy Spirit can put power into the Word. The first power of the Holy Spirit will always be the Word. Then comes the other. But then it continues. He begins speaking how they begin suffering at the hands of their fellow pagans, former pagans, they were Greeks, the way that the Jewish believers suffered at the hands of the Jews who rejected Jesus. And he says that these went on to try to hinder them even from speaking to the Gentiles. Now, the mentality of the Jews at this time would have been a fear of another Samaritan sect. The Samaritans were basically non-Jews who intermarried with Jews and made a rival Judaism, okay? That was always their fear. This goes back to Acts chapter 8. When the Samaritans were first saved, the apostles immediately sent some of the apostles up to Samaria. They were always afraid of a parallel Judaism that wasn't biblical. Legitimate concern, but when you begin suppressing biblical truth, <laughs> To protect against an error, you have a problem. You correct error with truth. You don't correct error with another error. Charismania is an error. But you don't correct that error with the error of cessationism. Okay? Replacement theology is an error. But you don't correct the error of replacement theology with another error called dual covenant theology saying Jews don't need to be saved. We correct error with truth. We don't correct error with error. Today, we have people who try to correct error with error. That was never what Paul did. Much of the history of the church began by trying to correct error with error. The thing you saw yesterday in Berea with the priest and the icons and the necromancy, these things began by trying to correct error with error. There was a church council called Chalcedon, 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 different people pronounce it differently. I'd like to know how the Greeks pronounce it. <laughs> but basically, there were people denying the deity of Christ. You cannot overstate the deity of Christ. You can't overstate God being God. But what you can do is understate his humanity. <laughs> you can't overstate his deity. You can understate his humanity. So man is separated from God because of sin. We can't go to Jesus. He's God. We're separated because of sin. They're trying to uphold the deity of Christ. So what they say is, we need an intercessor between God and man. And Jesus is God, that must be Mary. <laughs> you understand what happens? No, no, no. 
Jesus was God who became a man that we could have access to God. Uh, it, they, you can't overstate his deity, but you can't understate his humanity. That's how all this stuff comes about. And they had things in their culture that just lent themselves to it. Like Minerva, like Aphrodite, like Mary, and the messengers of the gods. This kind of mentality just got into the church. That's how the Greek Orthodox began. Began this blend, this curious blend of what was biblical, influenced by this Hellenistic worldview. It comes from co correcting error with error. That's how it made headway. Satan gets one error going, and once he gets that error going, he tries to correct that error with another error. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You can take mercury or you can take lead. They, in, in the 19th century, they were using things like mercury and lead to cure diseases. Well, they were efficacious against the symptoms, even the pathology of these diseases. But they were... <laughs> But, but the cure would kill you even quicker sometimes. <laughs> oh, it worked. You know, the, there's, there's things today physicians don't like to prescribe, like hydrocortisone, prednisone. They don't like to prescribe. It can affect vision. It can affect all kinds of things for, for, for certain kinds of respiratory diseases. Why don't they like to prescribe it? Well, it works. Yeah, it works, but it's dangerous. There's too many side effects. We don't like to give this stuff. It's too dangerous. The, you get to the point where the cure is worse than the disease. That was something that very much happened in the early church. Paul always emphasized correcting error with truth. Then he goes on speaking about how he was going to send Timothy. But before that, he talks about the time being short. The time being short in verse 17. But brethren, having been bereft of you for a short while in person, not in spirit, we were all the more eager with great desire to see your face. He wanted to see these people, for we wanted to come to you. I, Paul, more than once, yet Satan thwarted us. Remember, God prevented them from preaching in certain areas of Asia Minor when they were first called to Macedonia. Here, Satan prevents them. Now, when Satan intervenes against the plans of God and attacks them, sometimes he succeeds. But whenever Satan succeeds, it is always a gambit. It is always a gambit. You lose a rook, <laughs> but now you're in check. You put your, you, you put your opponent in check. You just lost your queen. Yeah, but now it's checkmate. Whenever God allows Satan to have a victory, it is always a gambit. The ultimate example of this, of course, was the cross. Okay, he thought he crucified the Lord of glory, but God raised him from the dead. Do not think Satan will not attack. Do not think he will not have victories. He can attack, he will attack, and he does have victories. The only thing we can hold on to is ultimately all things will work together for the better. But Satan can indeed, can indeed intervene in the purposes of God. And God will allow it. But when God allows it, it's always within his purposes in the scheme of his greater plan. When things go wrong for us, God allows it. Now, one of the reasons God may allow it is because he's trying to get us in balance. Maybe we've gone off. Maybe we're not being what we're supposed to be, and he's allowing this adversity to happen, so we will repent or seek him more or something of this. He's trying to use it to bring correction into our own lives or ministries or families or whatever it is. That may be a reason, but it may not be the only reason. Yes, God will use Satan as his agent of correction or in, in the process of, of, of bringing some kind of redirection to our lives or correction to our lives that is true, but that's not the only reason it'll happen. Satan just attacks because he's Satan. We are on enemy turf. We are heralding in a new age. The time is indeed short. Just think. Think of yourself as a commando parachuted on back of enemy lines before the invasion. <laughs> you are making way for an invasion. Every one of us is on enemy territory and we are making way for an invasion, for the return of Christ. So what happens when commandos are parachuted on back of enemy lines? The enemy tries to get those commandos because he knows those commandos are making preparation for the coming invasion. He tries to stop the invasion by wiping out the commandos that have been airdropped. Well, think of yourself as the commandos. We are here to usher in a coming age. We're preparing for the return of Christ. That's the mentality that Paul had, and it's the mentality that we should have. 
this wears him out. Now, what happens here to Paul, Satan thwarted us. Look at verse 3. When we could endure it no longer, we thought it best to be left at Athens. This is a microcosm, a micro harbinger of what the prophet Daniel called the shattering of the power of the holy people. It is something that will happen and again in the last days, yes? Sorry, what verse was that? What chapter? chapter 3, verse 1. The shattering of the power of the holy people. A time will come when the church will face an hour of challenge in such a way as Satan will almost have a free hand. Up till now, he operates within parameters. God will allow him to go this far, no further. Like the book of Job. Build the fence around him. You can do this, 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 but you can't do this. For a three and a half year period, at least in the end, at least a three and a half year period, it's going to, the parameters are going to be broadened. Satan will seek to change the time and the times as we looked at yesterday, and they will be given into his hands for that season. Jesus had three and a half years of public ministry. Christ had three and a half years. Antichrist will demand and receive the same amount of time. Satan will try to wear out the saints of the Most High, and we will reach the same point that Paul reached, where we just became discouraged and we just couldn't take it anymore. We just could not go on. He could not go on, certainly in his own strength, but we could never go on in our own strength. It just got to the point we could endure it no longer. Jesus spoke of work while you have the light. Night will come when no man can work. A time will come when we will not be able to go on. We will only be able to hang on. A time comes in the last days where we can't go on. We're simply not called to go on. We will simply be called to hang on. Okay? To hang on. Now, there are different things in the Bible that explain this. One is maternal birth, living a baby. Okay? Well, you get used to morning sickness. A mother, expected mother, will get used to morning sickness, and she will get used to back pain, and she will get used to draining her bladder every 30 seconds, and she'll get used to all this kind of stuff, and to getting plump. She'll get used to all this stuff, but she just goes on. Just goes on, goes on, goes on, goes on, goes on, until the contractions begin. Now she doesn't go on, she just hangs on. Okay? Well... Obstetrics, is, obstetrics and seismology are the two things the Bible uses most to illustrate this period that's coming at the end of time. One is seismology with the earthquakes. The, 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 uh, the, the tremors become more and more frequent before the tectonic plate shift, as the geologists tell us. And of course, contractions increase in intensity as we approach delivery of the baby. Okay? Well, more about that when we get to Patmos. But this is what will happen. Remember, what happens to Jesus happens to the apostles. And that is a picture of what will happen to the church in the last days. More about this on Patmos. Let's continue. So he sends Timothy, God's fellow worker. He sends this half-Jewish young pastor. Uh, a minister is failing, a preacher is failing if he's not helping to groom younger preachers. <coughs> Moses began training up people like Caleb and Joshua long before Moses left the scene. The time to begin training up young pastors is not when you have two years left of ministry, it's when you have ten years left of ministry, <laughs> or twenty years left of ministry even, or more. You have to begin grooming new people right from the beginning. And one of the ways he grooms them is he sends them out under supervision. Anyway, I only mentioned this in passing. Then he gets to an issue of sanctification in chapter 4. Okay. Here we see something we'll be looking at more closely when we get to Corinth. Remember, the Greek world had wild sexual debauchery of both the heterosexual and a homosexual kind, and bisexuality was widespread and culturally endemic. Most people saw nothing wrong with it as it's becoming in these last days, okay? There was always a danger of people bringing their sexual baggage with them into the church. There was always an element of danger of this, and Paul was warning about it. 
but he talks about sexual morality within holy matrimony in terms of sanctification. Beginning in verse 3, this is the will of God, your sanctification. That is, you abstain from sexual immorality. Okay? Uh, that, that's what he's talking about. Uh, the word there would be pornea. We get the word pornography, fornication. That each of you know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor, not in lustful passion like the Gentiles who do not know God, that no man transgress and defraud his brother in the matter, because the Lord is avenger. And all these things, just as we also told you before and solemnly warn you, for God has not called us for the purpose of impurity, but in sanctification. Okay? Consequently, he who rejects this is not rejecting man, but God, who gives the Holy Spirit to you. Very frequently, when the Bible speaks of the return of Jesus, it uses wedding language. It uses marital language, because the church is the bride of Christ, and he's the coming bridegroom. You see this in Matthew 25, but what Paul is doing here is, exp is expounding on the marital theme from the Olivet Discourse. Remember the epistles explain the Olivet Discourse as the Olivet Discourse explains the apocalyptic literature. In Revelation, you have the spirit and the bride say, come. Matthew 25, Jesus speaks of the, 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 the bridegroom coming for the, the, with the wise and foolish virgins. Well, here again, you see the same marital theme. The Bible frequently uses the marital or the nuptial motif in explaining the return of Christ. Sanctification. I've explained this before, but we have people who may not be familiar with our tapes. This is a wedding ring, and in a Jewish wedding, you stand under the hoopah. His banner over me is love. And you say, With this ring I wed thee according to the laws of Moses and Israel. That word for wed in Hebrew, mekudesh, is the word sanctification. It is used, is the same word used for the purification process, and the sanctification process that the high priest had to go through on the Day of Atonement. He had, we have a new tape coming out soon on, on, on Atonement, and I explain this. The high priest went through this ritual of mekudesh, being set apart. Only the one set apart could enter the temple, okay? It's the same idea. Well, your body, if our body is a temple of the Holy Spirit, only the one who was set apart by God for that purpose can enter. If, if someone other than the high priest at the appropriate time entered the temple, the Holy of Holies, it would be an abomination. God's temple would be defiled. Because he is the only one who was sanctified by God to enter it. Well, it's the same in consummating a marriage. If someone other than the one who was sanctified, set apart by God, enters his wife, the Hebrew talks about consummating a marriage, he went into her. You see this in the Old Testament. Niknaspa, Niknaspa, he went into her. If someone other than the one sanctified for the purpose by God goes into her, it's fornication, it's an abomination. It's something which is defiling. Again, the marital relationship, marital intimacy, teaching about the relationship of God with Israel and Christ with the church. Well, you wouldn't want somebody fooling around with your wife, well, God doesn't want somebody fooling around with his wife. There is much more to sexual immorality than sexual immorality. It's more than a social sin. It's, it, it, it completely violates the design of marriage for what God intended marriage to be. It's, marriage teaches about things divine. It teaches about things eternal. Now again, I've explained this before a number of times, but we're made in his image and likeness. Niknaspa. One person goes inside of another person and the third person is procreated. It's one in three, it's three in one. That term for oneness in Hebrew, achad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is oneness. Shema Israel Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. That oneness is the same term in Hebrew for Adam and Eve becoming one flesh. The oneness that takes place in holy matrimony reflects the triunity of the Godhead. There is much more to adultery and fornication than adultery and fornication. It is marital relationship is to be holy. It is set apart. It is to teach us about God's own nature and about his relationship with his people. <laughs> okay? Hence, by hurting the, sh the shadow, the shadow, by obstructing the shadow, you give a wrong impression of the, of the image. You give a wrong uh, impression of what's causing the shadow, of the substance. Okay, the shadow and the substance. Well, 
the shadow teaches about the substance. But if you mess with the shadow, which is marriage and family and things like this, people are not going to see clearly what the substance is supposed to be like. Now, that's why God hates divorce. Now, notice you see more and more Christians getting divorced, more and more preachers getting divorced and staying in the ministry. More and more of this stuff. They're all Robert's son, the they're, they're, they're Hal Lindsey, they're, they're just getting divorced and remarried. It means nothing to these people. But these are people who are pastors. These are people who are supposed to be leaders of the church. And they're doing this stuff. Uh, these people are void of holiness. Now again, this idea becomes very important. The idea of marriage becomes very important in understanding the return of Christ because he's coming as a bridegroom. With this background, he begins speaking. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, in verse 13 of chapter 4, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. Where there's a death of a believer, there's a sense of loss, but there's never a sense of despair. Once again, the death of a believer is never called death, it is called sleep. Death is the second death. Real death is that which is eternal. Unsaved people die. Christians do not die. They go to sleep. They wake up again. We explain this on the thanatology tape. Okay? When you go to sleep, your, your consciousness enters a different realm. You see dead people alive again when you dream. You see past events happening in the here and now. You see future events happening in, in, in the present. Past, present, and future become the same in a dream. That's what happens when you enter eternity. You are in the conscious presence of the Lord, but past, present, and future become the same, like in the book of Revelation, the lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. This is a complicated subject, looking at the two Greek words, kairos and chronos, but we deal with it on the thanatology tapes. That's what Paul is talking about here. He's talking about those who've gone to sleep. Uh, for if we believe that Jesus died and, and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. The first thing we're going to see when Jesus comes back, or when we're resurrected, Jesus comes back, if, if we're raptured, the first thing we're going to see is him. The second thing we're going to see is our loved ones. The second thing we're going to see is our loved ones. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord shall not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with the shout of the voice of an archangel and the trumpet of God. The dead in Christ will rise first. We'll talk about how this trumpet of God relates to the Feast of Trumpets and the trumpets in the Old Testament when we get to Patmos, when we look at the trumpets. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up that word caught up is harpezo, arpezo in Greek. It's snatch away. It's what a thief does. Okay. He's coming like a thief in the night. Snatch away. We'll be stolen out of here. Together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Remember, he went in the clouds. He's coming back in the clouds. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Now, as to times and epics, brethren, you have no need of anything to be written to you. For you yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief. This idea of coming like a thief goes hand in hand with the caught up, the snatch away. It's a word of what, like a purse snatcher, what a thief would do. Just quick, it's gone. Be careful on the subway in New York or London. It's gone. Well, that's what it's going to be like. This is the big one in verse 3. While they are saying peace and safety, then destruction will come upon them. Suddenly, like birth pangs upon a woman with child, they will not escape. Again, you have the obstetric analogy. When men say peace and security, <coughs> the Antichrist will initially attempt to counterfeit the millennium. He will make it seem like the world is getting better or can get better. In a time of economic chaos, in a time of environmental catastrophe, more and more tsunamis, more and more natural disaster, what is happening? There will be fear and anxiety among the nations, none of them knowing the way out. And this guy is going to come and give a solution that's going to seem plausible to people who don't know Jesus. 
There's one problem he's going to say. It's these fundamentalist Christians, these even, okay? And those other ones, the Jews, we got to deal with them too, okay? This becomes the issue, this becomes the problem. They will think they can have the peace and security. Things cannot go back to normal. <laughs> but this will be the attempt. Now let's look at the analogy he makes here. But you, brethren, are not in darkness that that day should overtake you like a thief. Again, like a thief. We do not know the day of his coming or the hour. But we should know what part of the night, what part of the tribulation he's coming. It should not overtake us like a thief. We should not be taken by surprise. Saved Christians should not be taken by surprise. Okay? That's for people in the darkness. You are sons of light. This I, we are not of the night. We are of the not of night nor of darkness. Night and darkness again are the most common metaphors for the great tribulation in the end. He's coming like a thief in the night. The bridegroom comes in the Song of Revelation in the night for the bride. The bridegroom comes in Matthew 25 in the night. Work while you have the light. This night will come. No man can work. The world is of the darkness. We're of the light. This whole motif of the sons of light and sons of darkness was well known in the ancient Near East. Greeks had concepts of it. The Essenes had concepts of it in the Dead Sea Scrolls. The Zoroastrians, the ancient Persians had concepts of it. And of course, so did the Jews and the early Christians. This idea of the light and dark, okay? I'll explain when we get to Athens how Plato even knew about this and tried to explain it to the Greeks. Okay? So what Paul is doing here is he's looking for common ground. Things that the Greeks had some awareness of, but he was bringing a theologically correct interpretation into it. More about this when we get to Corinth and we look at Paul the rabbi, Paul the philosopher. But let's look. Let us not sleep as others do, but let us be alert and be sober. For those who sleep do their sleeping at night, those who get drunk get drunk at night. But since we are of the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of love, and it speaks about the armor, similar to what you have in Isaiah and in Ephesians. And it warns about the way we should live because we're getting ready to get out of here. The point being this, sobriety and don't sleep. In figure, this relates to the way the apostles slept when they came to arrest Jesus, remember? They were all sleeping. You should keep watching, you should keep watching, you should keep watching. Okay. The only reason they made it out of there alive was because of him. <laughs> okay. Keep watching, keep watching. The virgins all slept, remember? There's this big danger of, even the wise virgins, were sleeping, except that they already had the oil in their lamps. There's this idea of, of wanting to go to sleep. Let's give up. Now Laodicea wants to sleep anyway because it's lazy. <laughs> okay. Laodicea is in big trouble. It's like an undiagnosed cancer. <laughs> it's a silent killer. Again, as we looked at yesterday, woe to those who are at ease in Zion. You see a mark on your skin that begins getting dark and bleeding, you better make sure it is not a melanoma, especially if you take your holidays in sunny climates. It's a silent killer. It's a silent killer. Okay, well, sleep is a silent killer. There is a big danger in the last days. To become lukewarm, to try to sleep, to think you can be at ease at a time when things are increasing in intensity and heating up. Second is sobriety. I wish people had some sense of what a lie and deception the Toronto and Pensacola thing were. There was much more to it than a bunch of silly, ignorant, biblically naive and undiscerning people from Holy Trinity Bedlam and Kensington Temple in Toronto acting like clowns. There was more to it than deceivers like Colin Dye and Wynne Lewis and Rodney Howard Brown and, 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 and liars in pulpits telling you it was a revival. There was much more to it than that. There was much more to it than that. When people are inebriated, they cannot make sound judgments. When people are inebriated, they cannot make sound judgments when they need to be the most astute and alert. 
there was much more to the Toronto thing than the deceivers in the Elam movement and the deceivers in, in Toronto and Assemblies of God. There was much more to that stuff than, 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 than just people acting like jerks and clowns. It points to this. And this is not the only place we're warned about drunkenness in the last days. Remember the good and faithful servant in Matthew 24? But if he becomes drunk, dangerous, dangerous. Okay. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Now, he gives a lot of warnings. One of the warnings is in verse 19. Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophetic utterance. Another danger in the last days will be this. Correcting error with error. Because we see the charismania, because we see the spiritual counterfeits, because we see the crazy people doing crazy things, saying something's the Holy Spirit when it isn't, the natural tendency of many people will be the pendulum. Go to the opposite extreme. We don't want the gifts of the Spirit. We don't want to be open to tongues or prophecy. The Holy Spirit gets suppressed. Do not correct error with error. Correct error with truth. Cessationism is a false doctrine. The same as charismania and experiential theology are false doctrines. Never correct error with error. Correct error with truth. An openness to the Holy Spirit in the last days when God will speak prophetically and speak supernaturally is important. Christians can be warned, flee by words of knowledge and by prophecies. Now, if you don't believe in words of knowledge and prophecy, or that might not be of the Lord, so he won't listen to it, <laughs> that is as wrong on one extreme as taking on board everything you hear without testing it biblically and discerning if it's of God or not on the other. There is a balance. Never correct error with error. Correct error with truth. This church was confused about the last days, about what would happen, and about the order of events. So confused that Paul would have to write them a second epistle. His first one was written A.D. 51-52. Now he writes the second one. In this second one, again, eschatology becomes a big issue to these people. What happens? There were people who were saying, well, because Jesus is coming, we shouldn't have to get a job. We shouldn't have to get a career. We shouldn't have to get an education. Why get married? <laughs> if the Lord is coming soon, why should... <laughs> it was to the point where people wouldn't work. We'll just eat our seed corn instead of planting. And they would even look for a free ride on the back of the church. In Jerusalem, where people sold their lands in order to give money to the apostles to support the church, you have to understand why that was happening. Yes, it was a picture of the last days, and the last days will be like that, when Christians will again become like a family needing to help each other, and the haves helping the have-nots and so on. Yes, that is true. But if you, say you lived in, uh, the, 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 most of us are English, suppose you lived in Birmingham, England, and Jesus told you, Birmingham is going to be destroyed in one day. Something terrible is going to happen, it will be a siege, and then the city is going to be eradicated and burned to the ground. Wouldn't you put your house on the market pretty quickly? Well, they knew Jerusalem was going to be destroyed. So when they were selling their houses and stuff, they, they knew the property value was going to plummet pretty quickly. <laughs> they had a reason for selling up. The way that they sold up and pulled their goods, getting ready to flee, which they eventually did in 70 AD before the destruction, that's a picture of the way the church would be in the last days. The true believers pulled together, divest ourselves and get ready to get out of this place. That is true. But that was not the case in Thessalonica. There were people, why should I work? Why should... We should live our lives as if we expect to be 100 years old. But we should also live our lives as if Jesus could come tomorrow. Now, he's not coming tomorrow for the church. We'll talk about that in a moment. But he can come tomorrow for me or for you. <laughs> there is imminence. He can come for any one of us at any time. 
We live our lives as if we're ready to go in an instant. Yet we plan our lives as if we are going to be here for a normal lifespan or, or whatever. What I have always taught my children is this. Plan for the future. Don't plan on it. That is it. Plan for the future, but don't plan on it. <laughs> plan for it, but don't plan on it. It's too precarious, especially in the last days. Plan for it, don't plan on it. Yes, seek the Lord about an education, about a career, about marriage, about a job, about a this, about a that, buy a house, buy a this, to do a that, open a business. Yes, as the Lord leads you and guides you. Plan for it. Do not plan on it. The problem in Thessalonica was there were people who were so spiritually minded they were of no earthly good. <laughs> a time will come when no man can work, when the hand of God will again close the door of the ark and nobody else is getting on. Until that time, we continue to work. We continue to evangelize. We don't go to sleep. We continue to disciple people, to plant churches. On the other hand, we also plan to be here in order to do those things. The Jehovah's Witnesses are a pretty good example of what happens when people get like this. They've made predictions of the return of the Lord even for specific years. And of course, they never happened. But there were Jehovah's Witnesses who, po who, who did not have major surgery and they died. There are ones who didn't marry. They never get educated. If you look at them, they're uneducated. Most Jehovah's Witnesses are uneducated people, and they don't educate their kids. <laughs> That's where they're dopes. Uh, you, you look at them. Uh, this mentality you see in the Jehovah's Witnesses was what the mentality was in, in Thessalonica. They, they're just dopes. <laughs> not only are they spiritually blind, they're just dope. They're just, they're just they're ignorant people. Ignorant, ignorant by choice. <laughs> if they think it's going to end, so why bother? This is the mentality that surfaces in Thessalonica after Paul's first letter. So he begins to write them about these issues, okay? And again, the issue becomes eschatology. Let's move ahead to chapter 2. Uh, let's look at chapter 1, verse 6 first. But after all, it is only just for God to repay with affliction those who afflict you. In the last days, this will happen. Those days will be cut short for the sake of the elect. Paul is talking here about something that Jesus talked of. In Greek, it's called the kolobo, the amputation. The amputation. The suffering of God's people at the hands of Antichrist is cut short. It's the amputation. The day of the Lord, it's not only God pouring out his wrath on the kingdom of Antichrist, it's God avenging his people. Vengeance is mine, said the Lord. I'm planning to do a new series of tapes soon, and one of the tapes I'm doing is God's coming judgment on the Islamic world. There are unfulfilled prophecies of destruction of Islamic capitals in the book of Isaiah and so forth, that have never happened historically, that must happen before or when Jesus comes. There's a, a, a whole wrath of divine judgment coming on Islam and on the Muslim Arab world. That's never happened. Well, God will avenge his people. But now let's look at chapter 2. We request you, brethren, with regard to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Again, not Christ Jesus, Jesus Christ. He's coming in a humanly identifiable form, the way he went from the Mount of Olives and our gathering together to him. This word, gathering together, is crucial to be understood. Epi sunagage. Epi sunagage. Israel is never called, uh, sorry, the church is never called Israel. Never. But in the book of Acts, chapter 7, verse 38, Israel is called the church. Israel is actually called the ecclesia, the church, the called out ones. The church is never called Israel, but Israel is called the church. In the epistle of James, in the epistle of Hebrews, the church is called the synagogue. The word here is episunagage. Epi is the Greek prefix meaning around, our gathering around. So synagogue is actually a Greek word, Greek origin. Now to the early church, what did this mean? Hebrews 10.25, forsake not the fellowshipping together with another or the assembling together. 
especially as you see the day approaching. In the last days, fellowship becomes crucially important, but the episunagage is the word there. Our assembling together is the episunagage. Gathering around the Lord's table is the same Greek word used for rapture here. You have two words for rapture, arpezo, the snatching away, and the other is episunagage, or gathering around him in the sky. When we take the Lord's Supper, it's a fire drill. We're getting ready for the escape. <laughs> Remember the Jews had to eat the Passover to have the strength to get out of there? For their journey? Well, there's a final feeding of the church. We'll talk about this again at Patmos. But when we gather around the Lord's table, we proclaim his death, it's a memorial, until he comes. It's a marriage supper of the, of the appetizer of the marriage supper of the Lamb, as I've explained it. We're proclaiming his death, we're looking back like the Passover, until he comes, we're looking forward. The Lord's Supper is the centerpiece of our fellowship and worship. We're remembering what he did, but we're having a foretaste of what he's going to do. Episunagage. Every time we meet together around the Lord's table, it is a practice for the rapture. You understand? That's the world. They're doomed. We're going to escape. All those wishing to escape, come here. <laughs> okay? Come to faith in Jesus. Okay? The same word for gathering around the Lord's table in fellowship in Hebrews is the same word used for rapture here. Same word. Think of the Lord's coming to the Lord's table. Think of Christians meeting together for communion as a fire drill. It's a practice for the coming rapture. Okay? Now he says this, that you may not be shaken from your composure or disturbed either by a spirit or a message or a letter, as if from us, to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. There'll be people, spirits, <laughs> all sorts, trying to confuse in the last days. He said, don't listen to it. Even if it claims to have apostolic authority, don't listen. The day of the Lord is once the church is removed, God pours out his wrath on the kingdom of Antichrist. That's the day of the Lord. Up till now, you have the time with the Jews, you have the time with the Gentiles, that's over. Okay? This is the day of the Lord. It's God's day. <laughs> Okay, it's God's day. The faithful church will not be here. Okay. Let no one in any way deceive you. It will not come unless the apostasy, the great falling away, comes first. What is this word apost apostasia? Not just a departure from the truth, more of a defection from the truth. Those who once believed it no longer do. There are many apostates today. I read an article by Steve Chalk, that heretic in England, the big youth minister in England. That man is an apostate. He says, I used to believe that Jesus was on the cross and God turned his back on Jesus, but that's not how I preach anymore. Hindus can be saved, Muslims can be saved. He defected from a truth he once believed. We see a mass defection. Another is the emergent church in America, this guy Brian McLaren. There's a fundamental defection from the truth. He says, he's people, they teach in the emergent church, that the Bible is not propositional truth. Propositional truth means absolute truth. The objective fact of the resurrection of Christ. The Bible's not about, about propositional truth. It's about relative truth. It works for me. <laughs> There's no objective basis. It's all subjective. This is apostasy. It's a departure from the truth. In the late 1940s, Billy Graham said, at this time in history, the gospel of Jesus Christ has three enemies. Marxism, Romanism, and Mohammedism. <laughs> he no longer believes that. He was right in the late 40s when he first began preaching in Los Angeles and in London. He was right then. He had it right then. After the Second World War, he had it right. <laughs> now you're putting converts back in liberal churches. Uh, there's a departure from the truth not just of individuals, of whole denominations, of whole churches. I have no doubt whatsoever that we live in an age of apostasy, but not just an age, the age of apostasy. What you saw yesterday with the Greek Orthodox, or what you would see in Rome if you come with us when we, when we do Biblical Rome, you'll see a process of people winding up with an apostate Christianity, it's true, but it took some hundreds of years of evolution for them to turn into that. 
Look what has happened in the last 10 to 12 years. Churches, denominations, people that were solidly evangelical, practically overnight, many of them in less than five years, have defected from the truth. It's the speed at which it's happened. Yes, there's always been apostasy, but it took them a long period to get that far at other times in church history. Now it's just gone off the rail overnight. Okay. Now this has roots in the Reformation. If we look at this when we study the church of Sardis next April. Let no one in any way deceive you. It'll not come unless the apostasy comes first. And the man of lawlessness is revealed the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as God. This, of course, is the Shikutsa Meshumem, the abomination of desolation we looked at yesterday, and we'll talk about again on Patmos. However, let's look at this. Reductio ad absurdum. One of, the, one of the new other tapes I'm planning to do soon, in addition to atonement and God's judgment on the Islamic world, coming judgment, is reductio ad absurdum. It's when you come to the Bible with a presupposition, and it says something, plainly, that doesn't fit your presupposition. So you say, well, it can't mean what it seems to mean. It can't mean what it says. It must mean something else. <laughs> This is a reductio ad absurdum. Oh, it can't mean, it, it, this can't possibly mean we have to know who the Antichrist is before Jesus is coming. The rapture is a secret. We're not going to be here when this happens. It will be the pre-trib. That stuff was invented and propagated by Schofield. The early Christians did not believe it. It is part of the deception in the last days to deceive the elect. Now, many good and many godly people believe it. Many friends of mine believe it. But it is wrong. Now, it's not a deception that means that they're malmotivated. It, it's not a deception that means that they're bad people with, a, with, a, with, a, with an agenda that's not of God. It just means they've been conned by something that is not true. It says, remember, the epistles are straightforward. There's nothing hidden in them. It, it, it explains the rest of scripture. It's a commentary. It will not happen. The Lord will not pour out his wrath on the kingdom of Antichrist until we're out of here. But that will not happen until we, there's an apostasy and until we know who the Antichrist is. Additionally, in the Greek text, the apostasy and the revelation of Antichrist are joined. I know people who are pre-trib who admit we're in the apostasy. <laughs> But there is nothing grammatically in the text to separate the apostasy from the identification of the Antichrist. They both have to happen before the day of the Lord. They have no grammatical basis to separate the two. But it's like putting something in, if, if you put something in parentheses or brackets in, a, in an equation, you treat it as one number, right? Or as one value, as one factor. Well, it's the same thing. It's just like a factor in an equation. You put it in bracket, you treat it, have to treat it as a unit. It's the same thing. Okay. He says, don't you remember when I was with you, I was telling you these things? They had to be reminded. Well, we have to be reminded. You know what restrains him now, so that in his time he may be revealed. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains him will do so until he is taken out of the way. And then that lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will slay with the breath of his coming and bring to an end by the appearance of his coming. That is, the one whose coming is in accordance or in accord with the activity of Satan, with all power and signs and false wonders, and with all deceptions of wickedness for those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth so as to be saved. For this reason, God will send upon them a deluding influence so that they might believe what is false in order that they may be judged who did not believe the truth but took pleasure in wickedness. The apostles hear a warning that God will make them believe a lie. If people don't believe the truth, the word of God, they don't love Jesus. If they don't believe the truth, they don't love Jesus. 
We deal with this on the Spirit of Truth, Spirit of Error tapes. Now pay attention. When people stop believing the Bible and inventing their own theology, like the emergent church is based on this, truth is not propositional, they say. This is a nomos. We have a law of God. In the Old Testament, it's the Torah. 1 Corinthians 9 tells us the same as there was the Torah, there's the law of Christ. When you say that's not biblical, and they begin saying, the Lord told me, God showed me. I got a letter, an email, that I read day before yesterday from the wife of Yaakov Damkani. He's an Israeli evangelist we used to support. He divorced a believing wife and married another woman. We had to stop supporting him. Dear friend, broke my heart, pleaded with him not to do it. His wife sending me, but God told us to do it. And you know, God does not contradict his word. There was no adultery in the previous marriage. There was no biblical grounds. Well, the Bible doesn't mean what you think it means. No, that's a reductio ad absurdum. It says exactly. There must be sexual infidelity. Otherwise, there's no biblical grounds to do what you've done. And because we stopped, we, we were his main supporters because he was so evangelistic. Our ministry and our supporters were his main supporters in England. I used to have him speak to our group sometimes. Not anymore. Well, it doesn't... This is a nomos. Lawlessness. The apostasy goes hand in hand with lawlessness. We all try to tell people the truth, truth the fruit of the Spirit is self-control. Ekrete. Oh no, we know this is of God even though we're out of control. Lawlessness. A nomos. The Antichrist will be the anthropon a nomon, the man of lawlessness. The fact that you see such an avalanche of experiential theology, people doing their own thing, when you point to scripture, they don't care what scripture says, we believe we make our own doctrine. This is the mystery of lawlessness. It's a mystery. But it's not to be a mystery to us. We're supposed to know what it means. It's a mystery to them. They're the ones who can't see it. You understand? They're the ones who can't see it. We're supposed to understand what this is. It's the mystery of lawlessness, and it is setting the stage for the Antichrist. That's what's really happening. And it will increase. He goes on talking these things, and warning, and trying to clean up the misunderstandings about the last days. And that's what we're going to try to do between here and Patmos, clear up misunderstandings about the last days.